how do you actually train to be hard to kill? What do you do? So one of the last videos I did, how to be hard to kill, this is part two. Mike's gonna take you through what I'm gonna do today. And at the end, he's gonna give you the three essential principles you need if you wanna build a robust and resilient body, regardless if you're going through an arduous course, selection, P company, the Marines, whether you just want it for daily life. Off the back of the hard to kill video that I did, part one, hard to kill, I got a lot of questions asking what exactly was I doing to train to pass special forces selection. To be honest, at that time, I was just cuffing it together with the knowledge that I had. So I got in touch with Coach Mike Chadwick, who runs the Red On Performance facility to develop essentially functional tactical fitness to build resilient bodies. So I've come up to Liverpool today to find out how that training has changed and what people can do to build a robust tactical chassis that I talked about in the hard to kill video. So I'm gonna let Mike step in and tell you exactly what they do at this facility. This is basically a research and development center. So what we wanna do is we wanna take what's happened in elite sports and transition that over into tactical athlete development. And the reason we call them tactical athletes is because they're those people who are gonna put themselves on the line and do the things we ask of them. The absolute bare minimum we can give them is performance. And therefore treating someone like a tactical athlete almost increases both physiologically and psychologically their output because that's what athletes do. They train to get better every single day. So that's what we do here. It's a research center where we can drive data and we can improve performance across a myriad of components of fitness to ensure that they're ready for absolutely anything that life throws at them. So if I, if I think back to when I was training in 2010 up to 2012 for selection, all these questions asking what I was doing, my first answer is it doesn't matter matter what I was doing because it's completely subjective to me. But essentially, I was doing a three-day split, I was doing cardio in the morning, and that was a mix of long, slow endurance and then hard intensity sessions. So eight by 500 intervals on the rowing machine, 400 meter sprints. And then in the afternoon, I was generally doing two lifts, a lower and upper split, five by five uh, lifting protocol, followed by some kind of Metcon. So 10, 20 minutes, kettlebells, burpees, whatever it was. And I was doing three on, one off. And then as I progressed closer to selection, I started to increase the specificity that was needed for the hills in terms of yomping, rucking, tabbing, however you wanna, carrying heavy loads essentially over longer and longer periods. And my aim was to finish the hills phase of selection as strong and fit as possible to put me in the best position to get through the jungle phase. That was my aim of it. So that's what I was doing then, kind of based on just what I was piecing together of general physical preparedness. Yeah. So how has that developed and what are people doing now and what are we gonna to do today? Well, if you look at the facts, what you did worked because you made it. But then if you look at the numbers and the reason why so little people pass is because not everyone fits inside of that or not everyone's got the training competency or the training age that you have to go and conduct that. People get it wrong predominantly because they go too hard too soon. They pretty much do selection before they go on selection. And that's what you see across the board. I would, I would argue the case that those who want to go on any sort of arduous course, whether that's commando course, P company, whether that's going on selection, if you put your hand up to do that, you're pretty fit. So what normally happens is you normally break or you turn up pre-fatigued. And exactly what you just said now, what we do here is we provide a targeted, specific training program to get to help you get over the hills. That's it. What you do post that is on you. From a soldiering point of view, we've said many times, you come into us for soldiering, we're in big trouble. So what we do is we're very good at staying in our lane and building the chassis, as you said, increasing that engine to an inch of its life and ensuring that you are ready to transition from the hills into subsequent activities. But that's the main, our main priority here is utilizing data-driven science to create incredible programs to get more and more people over that. Because more people can do it, we just have to train them a little bit differently. The aim may remain the same, but how we get there should and always will be different. Fortunately for the viewers, but unfortunately for you, we're gonna strip the guesswork out. We've got a whole team behind us here at the Red and Performance Center, from doctors to exercise rehabilitation instructors, accountability coaches and data analysis. We're gonna utilize all the data that you show us now through testing first, and we're gonna interpret that data and put it into actionable data that we can program from. Data is worthless if we cannot utilize it. So today what we're gonna do is we're gonna test you, and we're gonna train from within those numbers and showcase how we first of all get the measurements, and then how we then program from it in order to enhance your ability to go and pass whatever arduous course it is. Let's do it. So once you've utilized your warm-up protocols that work for you, 
we'll add a little bit of core stability and conditioning in there that crosses over into the subsequent session. Yeah. We utilize a protocol known as the three plus one. It's something I've taken from Dr. Stuart McGill, but the three are what Stuart McGill does in regards to side plank, thoracic curl up and the bird dog. Yeah. And the plus one is some anything that crosses over into your session. Um, question always arises, should I be utilizing a belt or not? And should I not be using it because I won't be able to use it on selection, etc. So what I'll do is I'm gonna fire over our clinical lead, Dr. Ash, who will discuss that very concept of belt or no belt for Simon when he's... Essentially, the, the role of a belt or a lifting belt when you're squatting, deadlifting, anything like that, not there to protect your back. So quite often we'll get people say that they wanna wear a belt to protect their back. Um, and that's not the case. The role of it is to provide some what we call kinesthetic feedback. So something for the athlete or the individual to brace against so they can get used to that bracing pattern. There's two trains of thought. One is that you shouldn't use it at all because that's not indicative of what you're gonna do in a real world scenario and situation. And um, therefore we don't do it at all. But what you might be missing out on by not using it ever is working up to your max and using that belt to brace against to provide that kinesthetic feedback so you've got a nice strong core so that you can elicit bigger numbers there that will inform future and subsequent training. So I like to not only have this as a prep for training, so there's a lot of research out there that showcases in regards to core stability and what I've noticed over time is this not only is really good for engaging that core and just making sure that you're aware of that, but it makes you athlete ready. If you do this every time you train, you know that your body's going to be put through something now because it comes over time where it's almost like igniting the central nervous system. Your body goes, right, I'm in, I'm athlete ready, which is the important part. Yeah. So it's a psychological tool as much as a physiological tool. And then the plus one part is something that crosses over into your subsequent session. An example of that would be up on the bar, remaining active, okay? So we're not passive, we're nice and active, keeping on shoulder blade. And it's very simply just mirroring the squat movement. Up and holding with the core again, doing all the work and down. And all we're gonna do now is we're gonna slowly but surely move into movement. So now rather than withstand those forces, we're gonna start creating a little bit of it. Nice and slow, everything's nice and slow. And all I want is five to six nice and slow reps, mate. All about that core again. So if you look at the movement now, hips, knees and ankles are flexing exactly the same as what you're gonna do in the subsequent session. Nice, mate. Okay, and what we do is we do um, two or three rounds of that. Yeah. And then what we do is we start then going into building up into that first rep. So the first rep of whatever's on your program, you want to be athlete ready by that point. It's rare, isn't it? It's rare that we warm up though, is 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 I can't not warm up. Yeah. And like if I don't have any stretching mobility mm. nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. So my my protocols pretty much for the majority of sessions are core stability, mobility, and then some sort of glute activation, shoulder prehab work, because the most common injuries that we can consider are weak shoulders, poor knees, and we can mitigate that through yeah. simple glute activation strategies, simple shoulder prehab strategies, and then ultimately moving into then um, moving into that first rep of that first session. And then once you finish that last rep, we're on the bar. You can have the most accurate prescription in the world. I can give you the right kick up the arse at the right time. I can give you a cuddle when you need it. But if your why isn't strong enough, as we go back to you, what you've always said in regards, you would do absolutely anything to be successful. If you don't turn up with that and apply effort to accurate prescription, then the numbers mean nothing. Yeah. What we've just done means absolutely nothing because you will still fall at the first hurdle the moment something gets a little bit arduous which it will. It's like I said in one of my last videos, you can be as robust as you want, but if you don't, it's, it's two sides of the coin. You can be as robust as you want, but if you don't have the mindset to match, you're not gonna pass. And likewise, you can have the strongest will in the world, yeah. but if your body just breaks and you haven't made it strong enough, again, you're not gonna pass. Like it has mind and body have to, you've got to train them together. Yeah, 100%. Happy, so now what we're gonna do is gonna move on to the bar, mate. On here essentially what it's showing you, it's showing you the range. So we've got the eccentric element, which is the black as we come down, and then the concentric. So we can tell when you're kind of coming off the gas in terms of the range when it gets heavier. We can also see what work that took, so in terms of a calorie. So that only took a calorie and a half for those five reps, um, which is miserable. Um, but the fit number I'm kind of interested in throughout all of this is your velocity and meters per second. So when we get down to about 0 0.2, 
that's when we're kind of going towards 1RM territory. So you're at 0.5 at the moment, so you're way off. Um, so even though it seems like a, quite a small change, it's not actually massive relative to what we're looking at here. Um, and then we'll creep the weight up bit by bit, and then that weight, and I'll plot it once we finish, to do like, well, I'm trying to not be too geeky, but I do like a regression model, so a, a reverse engineer what it is that you've looked at, um, or lifted, and then it'll give me like a nice curve, hopefully, and at the top of that, then we'll have a power max as well off the back end of it, which is individual, like specific to you as an individual. Nice. So, cool, there we go. Thank so, 30, back on. different but have you seen like a minimum effective dose in terms of what you can lift that translates into pass rates or being robust or whatever whether that's a percentage of your body weight or how or just a general number say on the back squat or the key main lifts whatever it is if people can get to it gives you a much better chance the NSCA used to say yes and the NSCA used to say 1.5 times body weight squat five reps in five seconds is 60 percent if you want rm but it wasn't really based on any real actual science so no but obviously the stronger you are better so strength if you're not putting it at the expensive aerobic performance the stronger you are the better you're going to perform anyway because that then relates to kind of rate of force development power output how you keep essentially when you're bounding forward or moving across the hills that's just repetitive plyometrics that's all it is the more powerful you are the, the better position you're going to be on so basically just get jacked yeah, yeah I, get, I get this question all the time and it'd be our life would be so much easier if there was a parameter that we could just hit we could just go if you can what if you can hit a 150 back squat and you can deadlift 220 and you can run a 20 minute 5k and your two milers sub 60 minutes you'll pass numbers aren't always Always the driving factor about success or not success it goes back again to your why, your psychological side of life. But it's also we utilize numbers to build programs from. It's the program that's going to be the one that drives you. Your why and accurate prescription are going to be the one. We can't get that without these big numbers. There's a, there's a definite difference though between people who are getting here who don't squat and don't do strength training and we have to spend 25 minutes oh, and going, yeah. your squat pattern is terrible or you need to change this or that. Whereas when you come in here with your training age, yeah. it's straight into starting to push numbers, starting to, like there's no dramas going up 20, 30 kilograms each time on this because you're yeah. still pushing the numbers and everything. Whereas normally we have to drag people out and go, Biomechanically, you are terrible. You need to do this, this, and this. Whereas it's fine to leave you on there and just kind of go, yeah. let's push it. Again. Start to feel it in the right knee and in my hip flexors. So, as opposed to, I'm not feeling it in my quads or glutes, it's more of that hip, hip that's flexion. Some, is that something that ever bothered you 10 years ago when you were training for selection? Between 26 and 28, I was training for selection. Fucking hell, I cannot remember ever having niggles. Or injuries and I, I could tolerate a lot of volume especially that period in Afghan where I had a couple of months where it's essentially living like an athlete a hard session in the morning or long session in endurance run depending on what I was doing and then another weight session in the evening and I could do those like three days in a row day off and then back in and just continuous so I could tolerate a lot of volume whereas 39 now I've had to adapt my training and become a lot smarter but also you know what comes back to what Mike's saying I'm not training for selection what well, I'm training for now is longevity and health and enjoyment. It's completely different goals. No need for me to completely smash myself or go for massively heavy lifts for ego or whatever. It just doesn't, doesn't serve what I'm doing. 
the problem you've got as well is your age is you lose power first. So that's the first thing to go, yeah. So that's like the limiting factor for quality of life in like older people. So as they get into like their 50s and 60s and 70s, certainly if they haven't looked after themselves and they've not trained, as soon as you lose power, you lose the ability to go up flights of stairs, you lose the ability to get off the toilet, out the bath, and that's where like they have to slip, trips and falls and stuff. Um, but a lot of people kind of negate that and put it to one side. Um, and you start losing power output from like mid 20s to early 30s. Like I said to my son, like, and I said it in one of the seminars here, you start dying really as soon as you're out the womb, nice. um, which is quite miserable, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so your, your hearing starts declining, and there's definite markers that we can measure, and we can see just how close you are to death, which is nice. So. Right. So it's 1:30. So 1:30 now. Yeah. So we're probably getting from your markers you delivered, you presented to us before. We're probably getting quite close, aren't we? And from the yeah. markers that we can see. Just as, as I was going through here, what I'm always looking at is this velocity in meters per second. Um, so as we start dropping down to like the 0.2 mark, that's where you're nearing like your, your max output essentially. Uh, so we'd be being at 0.382, which is still way off. Um, we'll now switch to a belt. Um, so you've got that, that feedback from the belt. Um, and then we'll switch, switch to singles as well. Uh, and then we'll go right up to 1RM and I'll pump all this data in and then come up with a predictive model of what your 1RM would be and then we take 50% of that and then we go into your unilateral. It's so rare that I would ever get any athletes to probably do a 1RM. Um, we get close to it and that's where, so whenever I externally, so we're internally testing there, we say we're internally testing the facility. Externally, which majority of our people are doing, so whether that's online, wherever they are in the world, a 3RM, a 5RM is absolutely perfect for us to then interpret into a, into a 1RM. And we can get close enough with that. Yeah. We then, once we've got that number, we work in percentages, zones, perception, from within that to train. That's the important part. Thinking back when you went through selection, yeah. Did you, did you say that 160 was roughly where you was at back then? The only number I remember is the 220 deadlift because yeah. I was in Afghan, I was in Kandahar, and I remember doing it in yeah. that gym. What I do remember doing is I was doing five by five on 140. What the key indicator here is, is the numbers are quite close, but there's mm. no correlation between your ability to pass selection now to your ability to pass selection now. So this true one RM of a back squat would almost be near on impossible to determine success over the hills. Just a precursor for us to train from. There isn't a single number that we can utilize that can say, if you get this number, you will pass. My whole ethos when I went on for selection was, I want to be as fit, strong as possible so that I'm as fresh as possible at the end of the hills. And it also applies, I've seen you talk about, if you, let's say you're doing the log run on P Company, if you start that and within five minutes, you're fucking hanging out. And then psychologically, you have to use every bit of mental strength to hang on as opposed to you've only got two miles to go and then you start to really feel the pain where well, you only need to hang on for yeah. you know 20 minutes whatever it is so the longer you can stay you know fatigue makes cowards of us all so if you can train yourself to a point where you can stave off that fatigue and it makes the same I talked about it in the hard to kill video part one when you're doing stuff on the range Kazavax, whatever it is the fitter you are the better tactical decisions you can make so you're, you're completely fucked trying to look for break points or whatever tactical maneuver you're gonna do is so much easier when you've got, you know, you're only at 60% of your physical capacity. Whereas if you're at 90%, it's so much harder to make clear decisions. And this is where to me, this training or any type of physical training crosses over into life. Like for offsetting stress, whatever it is, generally the fitter you are, the more resistant you are to illness. Um, like slips and trips, like you said, picking up injuries. There's no golden ticket. There's no complete answer, but you can give yourself the best chance possible. And you, to me, it's almost like you're creating an insurance policy. Like every time I'm training and stuff, it's right, I'm just adding into that insurance policy to hopefully give me the best chance of being at my best. 100%. We're now predicting um, that your 1RM for a back squat from a bilateral point of view is at 160. So then we can then split that down from a training protocol and we can work in percentages from within that to adapt. So whether that's if we wanted to improve hypertrophy, strength, power, speed, whatever, we can always work in percentages, perception zones. We want to build the unilateral strength. So your single leg stuff, because when you're on any of these arduous courses, you will spend 100% of your time on one leg. So let's train accordingly. Yeah, so all we'll do on here now then is we've worked up to 
through uh, a Fibre at Max um, and then done a couple of singles as well just to capture the data. It's all based on, based on velocity, so it takes into account your body weight and it takes into account the load on the bar. Then as we move across into the analysis, what I can do then is run the analysis and then based off all, so these are all individual papers. We've all done like different equations to come up with like a 1RM, predicted 1RM. Based off the last single, okay, you're looking at around 160. So this one out here is a bit of an anomaly that's thrown out to like 165. Um, the average is this one here, which gives you a 1RM of about 158-ish. But we're gonna, we're gonna sit at the 160, so just at the top end of kind of where the prediction models are sit at. What we'll do then with that 160 is staying true to like the specificity or the specific nature of selection, getting through the hills, so on and so forth. We're then gonna switch to being unilateral. Okay, so it goes again to some of the um, elements that I spoke to before. So about neural inhibition and kind of interference and mechanical issues. So we're gonna switch to one leg for specificity and for those problems. Um, so it's nice and easy. We'll put it in half, 160, so 80 kilo. So it'll be 80 kilo single leg squats, okay? We're gonna aim for six sets of six, but we still wanna develop power, okay? So what I've also put in here, you hear those little dings and bells going off and you hear the bad one quite early on. Um, I'm looking for no more than a 10% drop off in your power output, okay? So all of this now you're being forced to move quickly on one leg, okay? Um, so six sets of six, that's each leg. So it's 12 sets of six, essentially. Um, if we find, because we've gone in at the top end, that we are fatiguing, we can drop the reps down, okay? Or reduce the amount of sets, but all in the interest of still evoking that maximum power output to getting the most from the session uh, as possible. We've got the most up-to-date tech in this room. The numbers don't lie, we're not guessing, and we can improve you significantly by utilising them. What's key though is that we take all of this data and we interpret that into actionable data for programmes for anyone across the world. We won't have the BBT stuff, the velocity-based stuff, but what we can do is we almost get into the accurate prescription by providing you a piece of resistance that we can say, you can do six times six on that resistance. So if you trust the process by going with us and saying, listen, if you trust that process and you apply effort to that, we know you can do it, you will achieve and you will that. The lower the training age you start with, the bigger the adaptations really. And as I said before, is those when we work with more elite end, we're looking at like half percent gains over a significant amount of time. We celebrate that significantly. When you provide specific, targeted, individualized training to normal guys like me and you, big things happen really quickly. Yeah, so the reason behind kind of a vertical jump test, there's loads of different ways to do it. Um, so this one's the counter movement jump that we're using today. So that's to look at kind of your reactive strength. Um, and we take your body weight, okay, and your vertical jump height. Uh, come up with a little bit of a calculation that gives us a power output in watts. There's different calculations used, but we use one from uh, Harman, and it's a thousand watts as the cutoff, whereby if you're below that threshold, there's a predis predisposition to injury, potentially. But if you're above it, then that's kind of limited uh, your chances of injury. So we use that as a little bit of a threshold and a cutoff. Good thing about kind of a lot of the jump tests, and whilst we've got like lab research grade stuff in here, um, you can also do it remotely as well. If you've got like the technology and the know-how and you know what you're doing, like people can send videos across. Uh, we can analyze the videos using like kinematic software. Power, power. That's classic athlete that. He gave you a number and straight away you're like, am I above that thousand or not? Whenever we're focusing on someone passing the arduous course, the most primary concern we have is what we just mentioned. We have to stay the course. So we have to build a foundation of strength, as what we showcased in the start, by testing first and foremost and working within numbers based upon that. If we build the foundation, we can throw whatever we want to throw on you, Jeff, because you're not going to get injured. You may not be up to scratch right now, but that's not what we're looking at. We're looking at that you're going to stay the course. Once we can do that, we then look at manipulating variables by you going into unilateral stuff and working on now what it takes to pass the course. We're going to spend 100% of our time in one leg, so let's train accordingly. Then there's going to come a time where we not only want to stay and pass, but we want to win, because we need as much energy in the bank for what happens post the hills or post peak on the other climb, no course, etc. That's where we need enough in the tank to go next. We also know that no plan survives first contact. Loads of stuff's gonna get thrown upon us and we need to call upon any component of fitness at any given time. And we haven't got the ability to have these lovely rest periods that we're getting now. We have to have the ability to go again. That's what's known as repeated sprint ability or repeated bow ability. And also then have what's known as fought under fatigue. Not only are we repeating the process time and time again, gotta think in the moment as well, which is really key for where you wanna go just done now we've tested strength 
We've worked within strength protocols. We've then tested power. So we've almost gone through um, the spectrum of what we utilize putting anyone on an arduous course. We've learned how to stay the course. We've learned how to pass it. And now we want to win. And now we need to be able to call upon any component of fitness at any given time. Data is worthless without execution. Words are worthless without execution. So no matter how much I scream at you, it's on you. You can only do this. Let's go. So in order to pass an arduous course, the best thing you can do is invest in your health and performance. And the way that you do that is by testing and then training accordingly within that. So we look at stay the course, pass the course, win the course. And you have to follow that order. Most people go on selection or any sort of arduous course by wanting to win it straight away. And they do selection before they go on selection. You'll get fatigued. And as you mentioned before, fatigue makes cowards of us all. For anyone who wants to go on an arduous course or just be fit for life, all I need you to do is individualized training by getting strong first, and then working into percentages, perception, and zones from those top numbers, and you will develop significantly. And if you don't have the ability or the knowledge to do that, then invest in yourself and go and get a coach.